public broadcasting, I can assure you I do not have that skill set and do not have insightful ways to use my hands. I'm more like Ricky Bobby, where do I put my hands? But um, I want to first thank all of you for being with us today. This is um, certainly an unprecedented time and any portion of our community always relies on one of the most um, part, important parts, which is our education system. And so I'm pleased today to have the leaders of uh, three of our uh, institutions and to have a conversation today around heading back to school and what does it look like. And first, what I want to do is acknowledge all three of these folks for being with us here today. If you can imagine the amount of time and effort and energy they have put into making um, these decisions in an incredibly uncertain world, which changes with variables about every 15 minutes. And so as you listen today, listen um, from a community standpoint of understanding these folks have put a tremendous amount of energy to putting best foot forwards to making sure that our children are safe and uh, this is working for our community. And so with that, I'd love to, to welcome today um, Dr. Jane Lindemann from the Waterloo Community Schools, um, Dr. Andy Petit from the Cedar Falls Community Schools, and Dr. Tom Novotny from the Cedar Valley Catholic Education. So we're pleased to have all of you here this morning. And as uh, Carrie mentioned, just a couple of quick things and uh, from a housekeeping perspective, if you do have a question, um, there is a chat feature. And what we'd like for you to do, just in the benefit of the time and the space that we have allotted, um, and that we can give more time to our, our uh, folks today from education, please enter those questions into the chat feature and we'll do our best to aggregate those um, and have a question and answer period at the end. And again, if you could please to uh, hit from a mute feature, we'd certainly appreciate that. So with that, um, today what we'd like to do is, as we're heading back, um, we'd like to have each one of the districts give us a plan around what that looks like for their individual district. And so certainly appreciating there are a thousand different questions as all of us as businesses are facing, whether it's masks, no masks, you know, how do we segregate? What does social distancing look like for a five-year-old? Um, we realize that you're going through that process right now as well. So Tom, I'm wondering if you could lead us off and walk a little bit through what the Catholic school system will be implementing and what your plan looks like heading back to school this fall. Uh, happy to begin the conversation today, Chris. Thanks for the kind introduction. And um, I sure hope Andy and Jane find some time to get away before everything kicks back up in August too to, to re-energize and rejuvenate. So uh, we released our uh, reopening plan uh, to staff and uh, families this morning. Uh, I would want to give a shout out to Block Hawk County Health Department uh, who created specific guidance for reopening schools and shared that with the Black Hawk County superintendents. Uh, it's very specific guidance on how to reopen schools safely. Uh, and they encouraged us to do so. Uh, they believe that kids should be back in school buildings. So um, our plan includes the link to their recommendation. And um, in those situations where we could not meet the six feet of social distance guidelines, uh, we're gonna require our students and our staff to wear masks. Uh, just kind of as a side note, uh, we run a daycare facility that's been open since mid-March when all this began. And the guidance that they followed from uh, DHS uh, worked successfully. Uh, they've been open for five months and have not had to close at all. And they required kids age two and older to wear a mask every day. So uh, if you can get a three-year-old or a four-year-old to keep a mask on all day and keep everybody in the building safe, I think we can easily ask that of our uh, school age kids and our staff. So uh, I lead with masks because I know that uh, that's really the only piece of information our parents really want is what's the status of mask wearing. So. Now we're gonna have kids back in the building. Uh, when we can't do six feet, uh, everybody's got a mask on. We think we can do three feet, which fits with the American Academy of Pediatric recommendations. Uh, in the elementary school, we have a lot more flexibility with kids staying in the same group, uh, one group being in the hallway at a time and those kinds of things. Uh, our middle school lends itself pretty well to that um, also. Uh, high school is a little bit different. We run on a bell, bell schedule. There's not a lot of different things we can do at the high school. However, uh, we are moving to a, a block schedule this year, which does cut the number of transitions throughout the day in half. So instead of being out in the hall nine times, they're only out in the hall four times. So that'll help uh, quite a bit at the high school level. Uh, the other big change for our, our students will be the lunchroom has to look different than the uh, you know, large gathering space typically. Um, our elementary school is going to uh, do just grade levels at a time in the lunchroom. Uh, middle school, uh, fortunately, will be able to 
uh, socially distance kids between the two lunches and have our sixth grade kids eat in the classroom. Uh, the high school is probably the least excited group to hear this today. Uh, they're going to have to have uh, five kids at a table all facing the same direction and have assigned tables. Uh, so, you know, not real popular probably among high school kids, but the rationale behind that is to help us with the contact tracing um, if needed. Um, we, of course, will be adding uh, sanitizing stations uh, throughout the building. Uh, we're going to add, you know, additional clinics and, and classrooms. Uh, each building is going to have a newly hired cleaner, somebody just to come in and clean during the day. So clean classrooms as kids are out of them, uh, clean lunchroom immediately after each lunch group, uh, do common areas, uh, high touch areas like uh, doorknobs and restrooms uh, and those kinds of things. So we're going to clean throughout the day. Uh, on the back end of that, then at the end of the school day, once, you know, like uh, daycare has left the building site, we're not going to allow staff to stay all night long. Uh, we know teachers are notorious for putting in extra time, which is greatly appreciated. However, we need to clean the building. So we're going to respectfully ask our, uh, our staff to go home. You know, it's, it's five or six o'clock in the afternoon, go home so we can get the building clean and have a, a clean sanitized building the next morning. So uh, that's kind of the, the big rocks, I think, as, as part of our reopening guidance. Uh, it is posted on our website too. So if you go to cedarvalleycatholicschools.org, click on the COVID-19 resource page, and the new button there today is, is the reopening guidance. Um, thank, thanks for that. And I'm sure the high schoolers will be more than excited to all sit in one direction at the lunch period, as long as they get to eat lunch. Um, one thing I want to quick remind this group, this is being recorded. It will be um, potentially played back at a later date. And so just want everyone to be aware of that as we walk through this process. Um, Tom, thanks for that, certainly. Andy, moving on to you, can you give us a little bit of overview of what looks different for the Cedar Falls schools as we're heading back? Yeah, I certainly will, Chris. Again, thank you for uh, being the host for this and, and Grow Cedar Valley for allowing all of us to come on and talk through this, help answer questions and, and provide some clarity. I think uh, you're going to hear a lot more similarity between the three uh, districts and what differences. Uh, we've met several times, uh, not only uh, several times in the last few weeks, but over the last several months. Within Cedar Falls, some of the things that we're doing, we're, we are providing an option as we start the year. Uh, if, they, if parents uh, are an online option, and that would be a fully online option for students. Uh, if there's a health concern, if there's uncertainty about coming back face to face, you can select an opt in option. We are just asking parents at the elementary level to select that online option and commit to that for the first trimester, which is the first uh, 12 weeks of school, or at the secondary, the uh, first 18 weeks, which is a semester. Um, similar to Tom, we, we have a lot of mitigation strategies. Uh, our, our hope is to be face to face. So uh, we built, built out three plans, uh, I think fairly robust plans with those parents selecting face-to-face. -face. Uh, a, face-to-face uh, -face in classes in person. If I could just interrupt for one second. If we could have everybody hit mute, um, that would certainly be appreciated. We're getting a lot of feedback and this is incredibly important information. We all want to make sure that we hear. So if you're calling on a cell phone today, if you could please uh, hit mute, that, that would be fantastic. Sorry, Dr. Petit, please. No worries at all. So um, again, we're building out the three robust plans face-to-face. -face, so it'll be a face-to-face -face with, with everybody that selects that option as one option. If we have situation cases that arise, we, we have the flexibility to go to a hybrid model where we have 50% capacity of our students within uh, a class setting. And if needed, uh, due to cases and or tracing uh, and uh, other challenges, we have the option to, to have everybody go online and then always try to work back to that face-to-face -face model. Similar to, to Tom, and I'm sure Jane will talk about this, we put in multiple mitigation strategies, uh, passing time, lunchroom, uh, sanitation cycles, cleaning cycles, and what that looks like, uh, which uh, again, we know will continue to, to revamp and evolve as, as we continue to work through those and, and gather questions, which I think is important. Uh, but we also are really, you know, uh, focused on that social distancing aspect where we can't social distance. We are requiring masks too of students and staff. Uh, we've purchased for all of our teachers two cloth face masks and, and a plastic face shield. Uh, that way you can still have that interaction and have that vis visible uh, representation. And uh, a lot of times we, we do um, 
learn and adapt to and understand those facial features and, and what those mean. Those We always call them kind of some of the body basics. So we still want that to be, be allowed and, and acceptable. So again, we, we are trying to create some, some options, uh, but again, I think we're all gonna look very similar than, than what you might see as any differences across uh, the, the, the three schools that are here. Chris. And of course, I realize I'm on mute. Thanks. Thanks a lot. One of the calls that came in from uh, uh, one of our investors and questions that came in was, what does this look like for uh, athletics for the city of C or the Waterloo Cedar Falls uh, Community School District um, in terms of what any additional precautions they're taking, certainly as the baseball team heads to state or we look towards fall sports? <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of guidance that we've received from the the high school athletic associations, the the music associations, uh, as we look at you know separation, sanitation. Um, you know, it was a good model with baseball, softball. I think they did some some good um, mitigation strategies. Uh, we're going to have to limit uh, fan accessibility and access into any activities. We're going to have to do a massive amount of, of sanitation cleaning. Uh, we're going to have to, to try to minimize contact, which when you start thinking about fall sports, the first one you think about is football. Uh, the, the state release that they expect uh, that to start uh, at the beginning of August. I don't remember the exact exact date, but I think it's August 3rd. Um, so I, we anticipate that they're, they are going to move forward with those. Uh, as of now, based on the guidance that we received and what we've seen from the state. Uh, but again, we, we know and what we try to preach is fluidity and flexibility. Uh, guidance can change in an instant. Uh, situations and circumstances can change in an instant. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we can respond very quickly. And what we've said is use a scalpel instead of a chainsaw. And we really wanna target where those areas of need are so we can focus and, and adapt quickly. Fluidity and flexibility is a good uh, trait for all of us to have right now in the kind of post COVID era. So uh, with that, I'd like to move over. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Petit for that update. And with that, I'd like to move over to Dr. Lindemann and have her and give a little update on her team and what they've done on planning on bringing everybody back. Thanks. Sure. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We, we're really looking for every, every opportunity to share the message because, and, and to get feedback. So um, again, you're gonna hear similarities in the plans and that's really by design. We do kind of think of Cedar Valley as, as one area and the more consistency we can have among our districts, I think the better. So uh, I'll just quickly talk about the timeline for Waterloo's plan. So we announced earlier, we did pretty comprehensive stakeholder groups um, in the different areas for the committees with the return to learn plan. So whether it was health and safety or infrastructure or social emotional health or academics or what, you know, whatever it is, we had groups of, you know, between, you know, 20 to 30 people with parents and community members giving feedback along the way. So we drafted our plan. We have not released it. It does go to staff on Thursday of next week, one week from today, um, along with some videos that they can watch to kind of describe it. And then it will be posted for our families uh, on August 3rd. We have given glimpses a couple times. We've put out uh, what we just call a preview of the plan just to give parents some ideas, but the comprehensive plan obviously is going to be, you know, multiple pages long. So that's kind of the timeline there. Um, maybe just talk through some of the things. I think uh, our safety precautions are very similar. We do think of it as layers of precautions. So one thing by itself would not be enough, but when you start layering them up, we do believe that that adds an extra layer of caution. So for the staff, you know, and, and luckily I think, I think Tom and Andy would tell you the same thing we've been open. We're working. I mean, if you look, they're in their offices. I'm in my office. We have 80 people here right now. So um, we're practicing the things right now that we're going to need to see. Obviously, it gets scaled up immensely. But so we have, you know, before I come every day, I have to take a survey before I even enter the building. I have to put my mask on. We have directional um, arrows in our building where we just go one way. Our bathrooms have a, you know, a little sign in use. And we, um, even though there's three stalls, we only allow one person at a time. It's probably overkill to be honest, but it's worked really well. Um, we get our, we stop and get our temperatures taken on the way in and the way out. 
um, all of those things will, will continue for all of our staff. We have 1,700 staff members and um, they, will, they will all do, do that. Um, for our students, we are requiring masks. I believe, Andy can correct me, I believe every community now is within the contiguous area of the Cedar Valley is now requiring masks, which I think for families is actually helpful. And for the cities, I think it's an easier sell when everybody does it. Um, we are creating some opportunities for kids to remove their masks, especially for our littlest learners. We, we have ordered, we're trying desk shields. We've ordered um, thousands of desk shields, uh, 11,000 desk shields. And so we're not, uh, I think for the elementaries, we're really certain on how we're going to use those, but those will be, it's, you know, it's just a little three-way box, you know, a three-sided box where they will, it's, it Velcros onto their desk. And so when they are in their area, you know, in their area social distance, they can take their masks off. I think for kindergartners, that will be a welcomed relief for them. Um, obviously, we've spent a lot of money, and so, uh, you know, not every district has done that, but they may have spent their money on some other precaution that we're not using. So I think there's, there's a variety of things. Um, let's see, hand washing protocols, we are working on that right now. We actually have had, um, when I mentioned our plan, we've had having stakeholder meetings. We've just, in the last two days, we've done all of our, uh, we did elementary principal stakeholder meeting, uh, middle school, and then high school, and got some really good feedback. And this is kind of where the rubber hits the road. Our plan is written, and we've had feedback along the way, but when you actually start thinking about, okay, now where would Mrs. Smith's class go at 11? You know, that's what we're doing right now. So there's just, there's a lot to figure out. As far as, far as our buildings, um, we are creating opportunities for additional social distancing, actually all across the board. Same thing as Tom with the cafeteria. There will be some very significant changes there. Um, we are changing our ventilation system. We will be running HVAC 24-7 uh, to circle, circulate the air. Um, we usually change some of our filters. Uh, I think protocol is, uh, is every four months on certain things, and we will be changing them every 28 days. Um, and again, you know, there's the research is, is, you know, some people say, well, you know, I read something that says that that's not necessary. Well, you know, we're, think of it as layers of precautions. Each one, it, it you know, it can't, it can't hurt. So we're just going to keep adding those. Um, buses, you know, I think we're going to talk about that a little bit. That's obviously one of our biggest concerns because it's a little bit easier when kids are on, you know, in our buildings, you can kind of figure out where they're going to stand. But when they're on a bus, um, you know, a bus driver pulls up and, and they have 10 kids to get on and seven aren't wearing masks, you know, what do you do? And so a lot of protocols being worked on there. Um, even changing some, we, we are changing. So I can change it. Um, we are changing some of our, like our nurses station. We will have kind of, we're, we're creating um, with um, Community Points Health because they have our nursing contract. So some of the triage, if somebody needs a Band-Aid, all of there will be little kits that will be in each of the classrooms so that they don't have to go down to the nurses station for certain things. Of course, if they have a temperature, whatever, obviously all of those will go. But if they need a Band-Aid, if they need um, certain things, an ice pack, we'll have some of those right in the wings so that they don't have to go. Um, as far as the schedule, just real quickly, I'll tell you our schedule is, is somewhat similar to what you're hearing here. We are bringing our kids back in elementary and in middle school. Um, all five days at the high school, they, the kids will be attending five days out of every 10. So originally we had, you know, we had kind of thought maybe we would do like, you know, two days in a row or even three days in a row, but it really looks like after getting some of the feedback from teachers and, and principals and, and et cetera, we will be changing that possibly to an AB like every other day, like one week you go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the next week, Tuesday, Thursday. So it looks like there's some definite advantages of that, but Again, that will be announced in our plan coming forward shortly. Um, all, all families have an op opportunity for virtual or in person. Um, Andy can share a little bit more. We've been talking about what percentages are gonna come back in person and which per what percentages are gonna come back virtual. So we're not, I don't necessarily know we're ready to announce that, but I think I've been saying all along, it could be about an 80-20 split. Um, it looks like I'm not completely out of, off, off base on that. Um, we start summer school on August 3rd with 400 students. And so every protocol that we have will be used with our, with our summer school. And so, um, you know, we're kind of, I, I don't mean excited, like, wow, this is gonna be great, but I, I do consider it a little bit of an opportunity to really hammer out some of the details 
with that. And so we're going to be extra, extra cautious. But that's, that's kind of a glimpse of Waterloo's plan. Thanks for that. And I think the opportunity to have a little bit of a soft opening, so to speak, to kind of be ready for the full numbers of students as they return back. So one of the things that you brought up, Dr. Lindemann, is transportation. And I know that's an area that has uh, caused a number of questions. Do you kind of want to walk through maybe a little bit more in depth on what you're looking for there and how maybe uh, the business community can help? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have been talking, again, as all area superintendents, and this isn't just the three of us. This is Hudson, uh, Union, Dyke. Um, we've had conversations with Dunkerton and Janesville and um, so, and, and as well as the three of us on here right now. So we get, we continually are, are asked how our community can help. And so there is one ask we have right now, and it really is for support with busing. We are, we are on a mission to try to reduce the number of students who are on our buses. We think that that will allow for a lot better social distancing. We just quite simply cannot have 60 kids on one bus. We just can't. And so we are, we did do a survey originally um, th this summer, and I think Andy and, and I'm not sure Tom, they can talk about whether they did that or not. We, of the people who responded to the survey, um, over 50% said they believed that temporarily they could support us by transporting their children in the morning or the afternoon or both. And so we are trying to hammer that out a little bit, but a lot of people said, you know, we need to talk with our employer to see about, you know, how we could make this work. We know not everybody can make that work. If you're, you know, if you're in a, in a factory and you're on a line, you're not going to shut down the line so people can go get their kids and run them to the daycare and then come back. We know that. But if any can, every little bit helps. And so that is one area that would really be a help for us if we could talk about with our businesses and, and, and um, you know, any of our employers about how they could support flexibility for their employees who have children in our schools. Who ride buses. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great point as all of us move to more of a more flexible workspaces, we've responded uh, to the pandemic that that expectation of how do we help our children and our partner schools have that same flexibility, I think is a really reasonable ask of the business community. So thanks for that. Um, one of the questions that came in, I, I posed this um, to, uh, um, to uh, Tom is, from a legal perspective, are we able to actually have our, our professors and students wear masks? Well, my answer is gonna be slightly different than Jane and Andy's uh, because we're overseen by the Archdiocese of Dubuque in addition to the Department of Education. So uh, in our Catholic schools, we can absolutely require um, this of our, both of our students and of our staff. Andy, who wants to, you want to do rock, paper, scissors quick? Hey, I, I can go first. Uh, go so, uh, I, I think the, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we have the, uh, the autonomy and the authority to make those decisions within our, our school hallways and school uh, uh, classes uh, to, to make sure that we are providing the health and safety necessary. But both Jane and I are providing online options uh, that are allowed for any parent, any student to select those options. So if they say masks aren't appropriate, that, that's the avenue that I think we would encourage people to go. And I think the caveat to that question, too, is there, there are some health uh, um, conditions that would limit the ability to, to wear a mask. Uh, so we're, we're going to have the ability to, um, for us to be aware that if there is a condition where a mask could hinder breathing, could hinder some other aspects, you know, we allowing the face shields, doing some other uh, mitigation strategies. We're going to work with families and students to make sure we make the right decisions for them. So another question from a, a viewer is, uh, what will, what are the protocols in place um, if we have either a student or a staff member that does test positive throughout the year? Yeah, I could take that one. We have spent hours and hours and hours working on our protocol for what constitutes an exposure. Uh, in, in Tom's opening, he thanked Black Hawk County Public Health, and I think Andy and I would do the same. They have really walked this walk with us. Nafisa has been, I mean, I know she has to be overwhelmed as well, but I mean, she returns our calls. She, she's, she sat down and, or she did a virtual meeting with all of the superintendents. So 
we feel like we have a pretty good, pretty good feel for what constitutes uh, an exposure. So when we talk about social distancing, one of the things that Blackhawk County has put in their reopening guidelines is if you can't, if you can't social distance each child and each staff member, then you at least you at least make attempts to social distance groups or tables. So one of the things in our classrooms, I think you'll see pods of kids and I kind of describe it like this. So if you think of a fifth grade classroom and there's, you know, 24 kids and let's say that five take virtual and you're left with, you know, 19 kids or whatever, 19, 20 kids. If you can't get all 25 kids or oh, I'm sorry, all 20 kids six feet apart, you may put two over here, two over here, two over here and try to get six feet between the pods or three kids at a time. And I kind of, the teachers are kind of thinking of it like, you have the tiger group, you have the jaguar group, you have the leopard group. And so um, within those groups, then we will contract trace. So if somebody does test positive for COVID, you would instantly know where, where they sit, who their group is. That's exactly why Tom is saying five kids at a table, same spot every day. So you absolutely know where kids are going. So um, one thing we have not figured out, we're working with the city of Waterloo and with Mayor Hart on exactly the the personnel and the staff that's going to take a lot of time if we every time we have a positive a positive case it's going to take a lot of staff time and so we're we're allocating people to that but there are some things that have been learned from other companies that you know there there are places that you you know organizations that you can hire to help you with that and so we are we are currently having that conversation of exactly who does it but i feel pretty good about the how great thank you Thanks for that, that overview. Um, Dr. Petit, another one that came up from one of our viewers is, um, what will the specials, so art, PE, music look like, and uh, what will recess look like at elementary? Which was always my favorite question too. Of course, so I have two children that's going to be one in third grade, one in sixth grade, and that's the question they keep asking me at home as well. So I understand completely. Um, so specials uh, at the elementary level, I think uh, both Tom and Jane talked about this, you know, some of our mitigation strategies, it's going to be trying to create those bubbles. Specials will be in classrooms. Uh, students will eat in classrooms for the first uh, at least two weeks as we kind of create our bubbles and set our bubbles so we can do better contract tech tracing if there's uh, a case that arises and, and we can see who has close contact and, and mitigation. Uh, a lot of our, our strategies too are just going to be creating good hygiene practices. So before you go out to, to, to recess, you're gonna wash your hands. Uh, when you come back from recess, you're gonna wash your hands. We've uh, purchased multiple sanitation machines, uh, misters, things like that, that will be able to clean daily, different uh, high touch surfaces, uh, uh, recess equipment, things like that. Uh, recess will look different than, than it has in the past. We're going to try to create smaller pod, pods or pockets or bubbles for students that go out to recess at the same time, do some rotations. Uh, but again, we're probably not going to allow basketball, uh, flag football to be played at recess. So it's going to be much more low contact uh, activities and, and um, I guess um, limiting some of those uh, different um, sporting activities and balls and things like that that they normally would have. So uh, we're still working on all those finite details. It seems like every time you answer a question, there's another 30 questions that you have to dig deeper into. Uh, but I think, you know, with, with our mitigation strategies, we feel pretty comfortable, especially the two weeks, what that'll look like. And then after that, we're going to make decisions on do we lessen it? Do we keep those in place? Do we need to tighten them? Uh, again, fluidity and flexibility. Thank you for that overview. And one question came in for uh, Tom Novotny. Tom, the Cedar Valley Catholic Schools uh, overall program lists that um, testing will be done by PCR. And so the question came in from a viewer, what is PCR and who are they? <laughs> okay, so uh, my cell phone sitting next to me, my advancement uh, director just texted me the same question. So uh, we must have a viewer in touch with my uh, central office here today. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, get back to you, Chris, on that. Uh, that's uh, straight out of the Blackhawk County Health Department guidance, uh, just verbatim on, on a term that they use. Uh, so I, it's not a company or an organization. It's a kind of a test that you have that would indicate you're testing positive. Great. Thanks for that. You never know with this group. Everybody's got tentacles. There's texts and, and 
quick messages back and forth. Um, so one of the other questions that came up is, will staff and teachers have the opportunity to teach remotely um, if that's an option? So Dr. Lindemann, do you wanna address that? Absolutely, we are working with our staff right now. We have an HR team that is working individually with teachers who, you know, we have, we have messages out to our staff that says, if you have concerns, if you have health conditions, you schedule a virtual meeting with our HR committee, our HR team, and they talk with you, they have conversations with you about your needs. Um, the, the, um, the employees are providing doctor updates and, and um, releases so that we can contact the doctor because we do really want to work to keep people safe. And so we are, we are modifying and accommodating those needs as we can. There will be teachers who will, uh, who will be working with our students who choose to do virtual. And obviously we will be looking for if we have staff members who are not able to be in front of students for whatever reason, um, then then that's where we'll be going. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going we're going person by person. I will say that the numbers right now have not been very large as far as the the people the the contacts. I know HR every day. I kind of ask, okay, what's the number at right now? And so it is it is not huge numbers. It's not like we're talking about 200 teachers who are saying I'm I'm not able to to teach. So. We're, we're really looking at that. We do have some teachers who are pregnant. And so the, of course there's some accommodations and modifications we're doing there, but um, really, really looking at it one, one at a time. Great, thanks. And in the chat, you've seen uh, both uh, Tom Novotny and Nafisa with Blackfoot County Health have provided an overview of what PCR is. I won't touch those words in front of anybody. I'm not a scientist, so, but uh, that information is in the chat if you'd like to look back at that. Um, Dr. Petit, one of the questions that came up is, first of all, if you could reiterate what date the uh, plan is going to be released. And then secondly, um, there's concern obviously for the staff around their emotional needs and some of the challenges. What support are, are the district providing for those folks as they come back in an uncertain uh, workplace? Yeah, so a couple questions there. One, uh, we released our, our plan, um, I think about a week ago, maybe uh, 10 days ago. So uh, it is out on our website. Um, uh, if you click to it, it's right on one of our banner headers. There's a 10 page infographic that goes through the different options and scenarios, as well as uh, the selection for online learning as um, an option for any family or parents that choose that as what they believe is best for, for their family or their child. Uh, second question, um, repeat the second question. Sorry, I was focused on the first question and I'm trying to think of the second question. So the second question is just what are we doing from an emotional standpoint around, you know, an uncertain workplace for our staff? Yeah, so that's uh, social emotional learning is something that we, our intent was this year was going to be a major focus rollout. Uh, we have done a, a huge amount of work for what can we do to support students socially, emotionally uh, within our classrooms, within our school days, within our community, but there's a lot of components with our staff as well, socially and emotionally. Uh, we're very fortunate. We have our employee assistance program. That's a really robust uh, program as well. Uh, we've talked to all of our building administrators about the, the, the fluidity and flexibility, the dynamics of emotions through this, uh, the, the ferocity of some things that you'll see or ferocity of some things that you'll see that maybe you haven't in the past. Uh, to be able to make sure that as we work with our collaborative teams, because our teacher teams, we know they're the experts in content and knowing each of their students when we look at their essential skills and where they're at with their overall educational plan, look after your teammates. These are the signs and symptoms that you need to, to review to either look at anxiety, 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 excuse me, stress, uh, other things. Here are the, the reporting mechanisms. We put in and building out protocols for the same thing for staff to look after for students. You know, these are some of the things. Here's the process to report. Here are the, the, the aspects that we're going to build out uh, to ensure that we are providing for that. Uh, I think the uh, main you know, crux of this question is you cannot have a strong teaching and learning environment if you don't take care of the individuals, the people that if they don't feel supported, if they don't feel uh, and have a deep sense of trust, 
uh, and their own personal security isn't there, they're not going to be able to provide that educational quality that we all need, we need to have. So that's been a very strong focus that we've we've uh, maintained over the last uh, several weeks and, and continue to focus on as we approach school. Thanks for that. And that's certainly an important piece of, I think we'd all agree of just any employees as they come back in, in the changing dynamics. So it's great to see that you've identified that. Um, Dr. Lindemann, I'm wondering uh, what question has come in on if the schools plan to continue to have their after school programs. Yeah, it, and, I, and I'm not sure I'd need a little more um, as far as what, what the questioner is is referring to. So we've had questions about after school um, childcare, uh, YCARE, YM, YW, and so we will still have those um, if that's what the question is is pertaining to. Um, they obviously are taking some precautions with limiting some numbers and we're trying to work with them the best we can because we know that's very important. As far as other after school things like, I, I just got asked yesterday about Lego League, will we be continuing some of those things? So what we've done is just put a little bit of a hold on that. We just really need to get school going and just focus on the, the main thing first. And so we're gonna keep the main thing, the main things for right now. So we have put a hold on that. We've also put a hold on, uh, on visitors to our buildings for a while. We just need to have the, the staff and the students be our, our only ones right now. So um, there will be some more protocol that comes out with that. And we, you know, um, uh, jazz bands and different things like that. I mean, I've been, I've been listening to our teachers talk about that. And so we're gonna do the best we can to try to, try to have those, but right now our focus is on the instruction. So another question has come in regarding uh, grading. How will grading be impacted this year, especially on the high school level, it looks like, um, as it relates to having a changing environment? Will there be any changes to that, maybe probably dovetailing off of what happened in the spring semester? Uh, Dr. Petit, do you want to handle that? Sure. Um... So last spring, you know, we, we went into this with an understanding, well, we're closing for two weeks, we'll, we'll be back. And then it turned into six weeks. So as we look back on what happened in the spring and, and that had to be voluntary instruction, um, we, we uh, knew that we've learned some things. We've had the time to be able to provide professional development. We uh, worked with all of our staff. Uh, we actually ended the school year a little early and did some additional professional development for two days with all of our staff on assessments and, and addressing learning gaps and needs based on online learning components. Uh, we have something that's called teacher sap supplemental salary that we did some, some work this summer as they work with collaborative teams that is ongoing right now over some of those same ideas. Grading will look very similar to what we had prior to the closure. We are going to expect uh, um, that students are engaged if they're online, if they're in person, if we have to go to a hybrid model, grading, expectations for learning, acquisition of essential skills, what we, we call our kind of our, our uh, essential, uh, it's our learning-based grading model and, and making sure that we are grading based on the acquisition of those skills and the ability to, to show at high levels that they can apply those skills. So grading will be, be based on that and it will be required and, and we expect that to move forward uh, regardless of which model that we fall into, online, face-to-face, -face, hybrid, depending on the circumstances. Thank you for that. That's uh, certainly an uncertain um, time period, especially coming off the spring. So I love that we've, we've got a plan of attack for that coming forward. Tom, the next question's for you. Um, uh, one of our uh, viewers said that you had some uh, issues or you were developing a um, block scheduling program. They wondered when you would be releasing the schedule so that um, students could plan around that. Sure. So the uh, uh, schedule has been finalized. Uh, we'll share that with uh, parents at the beginning of August. Uh, again, we're excited to, I know they spent a lot of time exploring that issue last year. Um, and again, that helps with our mitigation strategies uh, moving forward. Uh, if a person is looking for a specific schedule in PowerSchool, uh, that won't be released until a week before school starts. So with that today, we've concluded all the questions and, and that have been presented in the chat. Um, and I, I think I would, would um, just one final question for all three. 
you know, you've got a, a great assembly of business leaders in the community that are certainly incredible supporters of, of each one of our school districts. And, um, and by the way, if we are giving grades, I'd like to make sure that these three leaders get A's all the way across the board for the prep work that's gone in. Um, because sometimes luck is where, you know, hard work and opportunity meet. And there's no question that the hard work has been put in on behalf of all three of you. But just if you could, maybe each one of you, um, just kind of give us a flavor of what we can do as a business community to ensure or help develop that um, there are little things that you're concerned about how we can support you um, in the public eye. And maybe Tom, can you go first? Certainly, so again, I appreciate uh, the work with the Blackhawk County Health Department and helping get us this guidance. Uh, appreciate working with the Blackhawk County superintendents. Again, as we have a community issue, uh, we make a stronger community the more we work together. Uh, as far as business, businesses, I think there's two asks, as Jane mentioned. One is uh, flexibilities with employees, uh, not only with getting kids to and from school on a regular basis, uh, but being flexible with sick leave too. We know the kid's gonna get sick at some point or, or the employee might, might get sick. So some flexibility there. And I th then I think uh, a message for all of us, businesses, schools together is, uh, it is a tough time, but uh, let's be positive about it. We know these are some new changes. Uh, they're difficult to accept, uh, but the more positive we are about it, the, the better our kids will feel about coming back to school. And that helps with that social emotional behavior uh, piece. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Petit? Yeah, I would reiterate the same things that Tom said. Uh, you know, I, I would just say, you know, as people come to you and, and you guys are all key communicators within our wider community, within your, your business and industry, uh, we have plans. We work collectively together as, as districts. We're much more similar than we are dissimilar, because, and that's uh, done intentionally. Uh, but we have plans in place. Uh, our, our intent is to create safe environments uh, as best as we possibly can, mitigate strategies, and, and know that when we have to change, uh, and as we become much more nimble, uh, we're doing that with uh, a purpose and, and with some mindfulness. And I guess just to, to make sure everybody knows, if they have complaints, direct those all to Jane Lindeman, uh, jane.lindeman <laughs> at waterlooschools.org. So, and, and on that, Dr. Lindemann, you'll get the last note, so. Oh, see, Andy, I have the last word. Okay, okay. I was making sure my mute was on, um, or was off. Um, you know, I guess I'd say the same things. I, I think never, ever, ever in the time, this is my, I don't really know, I think my 31st or 32nd year in education with the most, with the bulk of those being in administration. And I don't recall ever a time when organizational grace was more needed. Um, personal grace, you know, asking questions before yelling. I laughed yesterday. I got two emails within the same hour and one of them started out by saying, shame on you. Well, you can kind of guess where that was. It was shame on you. We need to see the plan. How could it possibly be? You know, we, we need to know every single thing. As a matter of fact, I need to know my kid's teacher and, you know, the whole thing. And then within the same hour, I got another email and it, in, the, um, in the subject line, it said, kudos to you. So, of course, I opened that one quicker than I did the shame on you one. And it was just saying, you know, thank you for taking time to figure this out. We feel like you've given us glimpses all along the way. We appreciate the time and the, the um, intentionality, you know, so that, and I just use that example because I know you all know that too. You get that in your businesses as well. And I see Todd Holcomb's on this and I'm sure he is getting some of the same, you know, you, it's just people are coming from different lenses. And so I just, if, if that, you know, if somebody would say, hey, tell me why you haven't released your plan instead of starting out by saying shame on you. It's, it's just two different things. So I think that, that organizational grace has never been more needed um, all across the board, but schools especially. Um, I think, I guess the, the help with flexibility is gonna be really important. I know as a mom with two young kids, I mean, I will have a sixth grader and an eighth grader this year as well. And I know that I have to work. And so I, I sometimes have pushed the limit. I mean, I'll, ad, I'll admit it. I know this is being video or recorded too, but I mean, there have been times when I think, oh, I think my kid is sick and I'm going to give him some ibuprofen and see how he feels. And then I send him to school. You know, this is not necessarily the time to do that. 
and so I, I think we all do that because I think, well, I just, I got to be at work. I just, you know, they need me and whatever. So I think that that flexibility is probably, it's a huge ask. And I even realize as it comes out of my mouth, I realize what I'm asking of our business community, but we want to be in school. And so anything that you can help, you can do to help us stay in school and keep the kids in school, because if we turn them all back out, it's, you know, it's not good on them. It's not good on, on anything. So we're going to do the very best we can to, to keep school going and to keep your baby safe. I mean, that's what we want because my babies are here too. And I think, you know, Tom and Andy have kids, you know, that they're, they're making decisions for as well. So. Well, well, thank you. And as all of you teach in the school district, I think that that empathy and the ability to seek first to understand then be understood is important for all of us as parents and community members to know that we've got three incredible leaders here and thank you so much for your leadership and working through the community and know that there are so many of us that are behind you. Um, I'm now going to send all of my emails, Jane, and start to you starting saying shame on you um, <laughs> from now on. But I, I just want to thank all three of you for spending the time uh, in a very busy part of your um, year and spending the time with us and outlining that plan. Um, finally, what I would say is if there are any questions or our feedback that you would have additionally, if you could direct those to um, Betty Wobina from the, um, the uh, Gross Cedar Valley office, as well as if there are anything that you would like to see in this town hall format going forward. I know we have plans to have the same conversation regarding higher education. They certainly face it even in a different uh, set of uh, challenges as it relates to on-campus living and some of the things that are there. So we'll be investigating that um, in the next uh, few months, uh, next month or so. But with that, thank you all so much. Thank you for your support in the Cedar Valley and working together to make this a great community. And again, thanks for joining us today here at Grow Cedar Valley. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.